<laughs> Greetings, everyone. It is the Sabbath, and it is May 13th of 2023, and we are going to start Ezekiel. And, hmm, there's a lot of stuff in Ezekiel. Um, Ezekiel is an odd, odd book in that there is a lot of stuff in Ezekiel about the far future and about things that are in heaven and about extraordinary things that, you know, descriptions of the Messiah and descriptions of uh, various angels that have different purposes. And there's a lot of description about things that are not of this world. And that is bizarre compared to most of the rest of the Bible. There are a few other places that this kind of thing goes on. Um, Revelation is one of them, the strongest of the others. Uh, Zechariah has some, and Isaiah has some. Isaiah's is mostly on on planet kind of things that are extraordinary. Um, th there are a few other references here and there, but that's the majority of it. Uh, Ezekiel gives us a description of a temple that has never been built. So that in itself is a prophecy, and we're going to see a lot of stuff about the temple. Uh, we're going to read a lot of stuff that's not going to make any real difference uh, to our understanding because it's simply about the building of the temple uh, and how it should be done. Um, so, you know, that does, that's not going to change everybody's everyday life, but it is informative that God has uh, given us such a clear recording of these things. And with very few other inputs, uh, that can actually be understood pretty well. So, uh, we're going to start here in Ezekiel 1, verse 1, and we might as well do that now. Now it came to pass in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I was among the captives by the river of Kabar, that the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. In the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly unto Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans, by the river Kabar. And the hand of the Lord was there upon him. So, we're hanging out uh, with the Chaldeans. And, hmm, give me a second here. Let's look at this for a second. Not terribly helpful to me at the moment. Uh, where is my... There we go. Um, so Ezekiel is hanging out, and he's doing his thing, and God's hand came upon him. Now, what does it mean to have God's hand upon you? Um... <laughs> The hand of the Lord was there upon him. He wasn't going anywhere. He was essentially under God's control. And this is a voluntary thing. God does not involuntarily hold us anywhere uh, very often at all. It's possible, but it's very unlikely. But Ezekiel was humble, and Ezekiel loved God. And how do you know this? How do you know this without it being stated categorically in the scripture, because God shows prophets that love him his things. And you know this particularly by Revelation, by what is said about John uh, in Revelation. And the same thing applies to Isaiah and to Jeremiah and to all these different men. The reality is, is that they love God, and God was therefore willing to show them things. And when God puts his hand upon you, then you stay and you check it out because it's going to be an extraordinary experience. <laughs> and all of the references that I've seen in the Bible, and I haven't looked them up specifically, 
uh, show visions and dreams and things of extraordinary nature whenever God puts his hand on someone or sends an angel directly to them. It's usually quite eye-opening. So we see in verse 4, And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, and a great cloud, and a fire enfolding itself. And a brightness was about it, and out of the midst thereof is the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. So, <laughs> if you followed that, it was pretty spectacular. So you've got a whirlwind, a whirlwind with a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself, and brightness about it, and out of the midst thereof the color of amber as out of the midst of the fire. So golden red coals. So amber, you know, being, you'll see those orange coals in the middle that are a little less red than some other spots. This is what I imagine when I see that, when I read this. And also out of the midst, verse 5, thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. So four living creatures came out of there, and they had the likeness of the man. So Keep that in mind when you read the rest of this. And everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings. So you've got the form, the body of a man, and four faces, and four wings. And their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings, on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. So, they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. And they had four, and they four had their faces and their wings. Was this a four-armed four uh, person-ish? Angel? I suspect. They had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides. So, talking about four sides, four faces, uh, and their wings. Do they have four wings? <laughs> Dunno. Dunno, but probably based upon the description. Their wings were joined one to another, and they turned not when they went. They went, everyone, straight forward. Yet four faces, one of them would always be facing somewhere. <laughs> but the reason that's being said is because uh, they didn't appear to turn. So I'll leave that one a mystery. I'm not sure how that works. Maybe the head could turn all the way around. Who knows? But they went straight forward, whatever direction they went. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they had four had the face of an ox on the left side, and they four also had the face of an eagle. <sighs> so we have a an angel. This is higher than a man, significantly, and these are special for some reason. And they have four faces, and they have four specific faces. And, hmm, we'll discuss this at further length. Let's read some more. <sighs> Thus were their faces, and their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of every one were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. So we have four wings. We now have verified that 100%. Um, two wings were joined one to another, and two covered their bodies. How were they joined one to another? I, you know, the description defies my ability to figure it out. I don't think it was the tips of the wings uh, attached to the other four, the other three. There's four living creatures. Maybe they were attached in some bizarre fashion that would defy flying, but I have my doubts. Um, yeah. It's hard to picture this. And one of the reasons I'm going into, the, into depth discussing this is because God gives us these descriptions 
and we have barriers to understanding what they mean. The first barrier is we're not in the same language. We're not discussing this in Hebrew. Um, that barrier being aside, we also have words of an ancient language that are used to describe something that is uh, indescribable without really advanced language. And they didn't have a ad language that advanced, uh, technically advanced with descriptions that <laughs> you need some really industrial <laughs> type equipment to understand. Um, I'm going to pause right quick because I just lost my people in Honduras. So pausing for a bit. Okay, so we're back. And so the circumstance is, is that, again, we're using a language that's completely out of date uh, to modern technology. And we have the language now, although it's vastly more complex than what the average person speaks, to be able to describe exactly what these creatures were like. And it says living creatures, and I'm going to say angels because there's no way that these creatures are not intelligent <laughs> and probably much smarter than we are at this moment. Our glory will surpass theirs later, but not at the moment. Um, these descriptions are God's descriptions to us. And the only way we're going to get everything out of them is by God showing us here in the end time some of these things. The descriptions are here as a place marker. They're here to help us to understand the glory of God and to understand some of the things that are in his realm. But they're a place marker for things in the future. They're a, they're a notification that the future is coming. They are a notification and a description of hev of the heavens or parts of the heavens that we can sort of understand and when god gives us a view like that it's best to embrace it because it helps us with our faith on a really basic gut level when you look at these things and read them in belief your brain expands a little bit. Your worldview grows a little bit. And this is important. So we're going to continue on. Uh, verse 13. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire and like the appearance of lamps. And it went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. So, these creatures travel together. That's what I'm reading out of this. And within their appearance, there is some fiery something. Lightning, lamps. The description here is something that you would imagine in a video game of today. Uh, and the appearance of lamps, it went for, up and down among the living creatures. So it wasn't just the living creatures themselves glowing, uh, but a, a power, an energy around them, but, but not in them. And the fire was bright and out of the fire went forth lightning. So electric, electricity and fire and all kinds of light. And the living creatures ran and returned as the appearance of a flash of lightning. <laughs> so they were fast. They were fast, and they apparently, you know, did a few turns for Ezekiel so he could see them uh, without turning. But <laughs> they continued on. Verse 15, Now as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. Now, I, now as I beheld the living creatures, behold one wheel upon the earth by the living creatures with his four faces. Doesn't make any sense. 
But there's a wheel somewhere in amongst all that business, even though they have calves' feet. And the appearance of the wheels and their work was like unto the color of burl. And they four had one likeness, and their appearance and their work was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And they went, they went upon their four sides, and they turned not when they went. And as for their rings, they were so high that they were dreadful. And their rings were full of eyes round about them for. Rings. Mm. Rings with eyes. Where do the rings go? Not a clue. It is what it is. Verse 19. And when the living creatures went, the wheels went by them. So the creatures weren't directly attached to the wheels. Probably. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. So there were some wheels that were seemingly independent of the creatures, or at least partially independent, and yet they all traveled together. And whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither, there was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. And I'm not sure if you guys can hear that, but... Apparently, there's a parade, probably, of the <sighs> rather, you know, limp style going on outside. Um, I can't affect that much, but I will try and speak <laughs> through it. <laughs> um... So we continue on. Verse 20. Whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went, and there was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them, for the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. So are there four different creatures working in concert with their separate wheels? I suspect, based upon that last sentence. When those went, these went. And when those stood, these stood. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creature was in the wheels. And yet, it's not entirely clear whether there are four creatures or one, or four creatures in one. Let's continue on, verse 22. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. Terrible crystal? Hey. Sorry, guys. I turned my phone off and then I turned it back on because I was couldn't get my uh, camera to work. <laughs> um, so, uh, terrible crystal stretched over their forth over their heads above. Not sure what that's talking about, but we're talking about the firmament. <sighs> this could relate to Revelation and the sea of glass. It's possible. Uh, the language is very different, but it still could be possible. Um, verse 23, and under the firmament were their wings straight, the one toward the other. Every one had two which covered on this side, and every one had two which covered on that side, their bodies. And when they went, I heard the great noise of their, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the voice of an host. When they stood, they let down their wings. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood and had let down their wings. And above the firmament that was over their heads was like the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above it, upon it. So I, I tend to go with the idea that this is the sea of glass, and that we're seeing this, and we're seeing God's throne, and the sea of glass is under God's throne, and these guys are hanging out under the sea of glass. I can be completely wrong about this. I'm just positing based upon what I know of the Bible and what I see uh, of this description. Because we talk about that firmament and the terrible crystal, and the only thing that comes to mind anywhere in the Bible is the sea of glass. And if you don't know what the sea of glass is, I will tell you now. The sea of glass, I am 
high, high percentage sure is the actual spirit of God. So when you talk about the spirit that God gives us, uh, and, you know, the Holy Ghost, as it were, the Holy Spirit, uh, I'm fairly certain this is what that is. So, and I say that with a high percentage of certainty. We know categorically, without question, that the Holy Spirit is not a person. It is the power of God, and it is a comforter. And it is not something that possesses us and makes us do other than what we wish to do. The whole point, the whole point of having the Spirit of God is that we have power with God. And there is no point at which God wants to possess us with someone else. So, and if you don't get that point, then you're off in the trees. The whole point of humanity, the entire point of God creating us as humanity is so that we learn to have our own character and learn to grow in every way in our character so that God can live with us as people, as we are, as we should be. Possessing someone defeats the purpose. This is why Satan does it. This is why the demons do this business. They possess someone so they can take them over, and there's no possibility that God will ever put them in, their ki in his kingdom in that state. They gain power by taking over the flesh of someone else in this environment. God does not do that to us. He will send his Holy Spirit. It will comfort us. But it is not something that possesses with a, an intellect of its own. So, that being said, I will continue on. So above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne and the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the appearance of a man above it. And as I saw the color of amber and as the appearance of fire round about within it from the appearance of his loins, even upward and from the appearance of his loins, even downward, I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness round about. And the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spoke. So let's go chapter 2 for a second, and then we're going to go back. Well, maybe I'll skip through here for a minute because I want to see where it is. I think it's up in chapter 8-ish, where we go back to this business. Let me go real through really quick, because I need to find where that is so that I can make sure I say the right things. It's not eight either. Okay, here we go. That's uh, verse 10, uh, chapter 10. Uh, the care of them is still in the right side of the house. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so let's continue on here. Actually, let's read this part out of order because uh, it talks about the same exact thing, and I want to get all of this uh, together in one place because there's a lot of things in between, and I'd rather just talk about this here. So, uh, we are going to read from verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. So we're right back in the same place we were a minute ago. And he spoke unto the man clothed in linen, although 
we do have other issues going on here. And we're going to read this again. This is not the first time we're going to read this. So I'm going to skip over a bunch of things that I will hit later. And he spoke unto the man clothed with linen and said, Go in between the wheels, even under the carob, and fill your hands with the coals of fire from between the carabims and scatter them over the city. And he went in my sight. So suddenly we have a description of what the amber and what the coals are all about. And... This is a big problem because these are coals of fire from an altar of God. And I say an altar because my suspicion is there are more than one. And these coals of fire <laughs> are going to burn Jerusalem. It's not going to be pleasant. Now the cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in. The cloud filled the inner court. so many things, so much density in everything that God says that it's hard to get it all sometimes. So we now have a house. The cherubim stood on the right side of the house when the man went in and the cloud filled the inner court. When I look at this, I don't know. My suspicion is that we have an overlay here going on and the cherubims have landed potentially over the temple or over the altar and the house is there. Can I describe this? No, I can't describe this. I can sort of imagine what I think it might be, and that's about it. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house, and the house was filled with cl uh, the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. So we have a house with a court, and I have a hard time believing this can be anything except God's house especially when we go down here in verse 5, and the sound of the cherubim's wings was heard even to the outer court as the voice of the Almighty God when he speaks. So now we have an outer court, <laughs> which is very much like God's temple. And it came to pass that when he had commanded the man clothed with linen, saying, take fire from between the wheels and from between the cherubs, cherubim, then he went in and stood beside the wheels, and one cherub stretched forth his hand from between the cherubims, under the fire that was between the cherubims, and took thereof, and put into the hands of him that was clothed with linen, who took it and went out. And there appeared in the cherubims the form of a man's hand under their wings, which we've already described. And when I looked, behold, the four wheels by the cherubims. Now we know four wheels, apparently one wheel per cherub from this description. And when I looked, behold, the four wheels by the four, by the cherubims, one wheel by one cherub and another wheel by another cherub. And the appearance of the wheels was as the color of a burl stone, which is basically the same thing as emerald. As for their appearances, they four had one likeness as if a wheel had been in the midst of a wheel. When they went, they went upon it, their four sides, went upon their four sides. They turned not as they went, but to the place where the head looked, they followed, they turned not as they went. So I get this better description. The head can move, the head can turn. Presumably the man's face is forward in this particular instance anyway. And their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and their wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they four had. So, in my mind, when I start picturing this, it gets a little eerie when you start <laughs> talk about all those eyes <laughs> staring at you. <laughs> um, <coughs> don't know. Be hard to make eye contact, though. I know that. <laughs> Disturbing is what it would be. <laughs> And their whole body and their backs and their hands and their wings and their wheels were full of eyes round about, even the wheels that they forehead. That This one defies my ability to express <laughs> how disturbing that is. <laughs> As for the wheels, it was cried unto them in my hearing, O wheel! And everyone had four faces. The first face was of the face of a cherub. The second face was the face of a man. The third face, the face of a lion. The fourth, the face of an eagle. And the cherubims were lifted up and this is the living creature that I saw by the river of Kabar. 
Verse 16, and when the cherubims went, the wheels went by them. And when the cherubims lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also turned not from beside them. <laughs> so the wheels went with the cherubim, and they did not go away from them. And when they stood, these stood, and when they were lifted up, these lifted themselves also, for the spirit of the living creature was in them. And we keep seeing the spirit of the living creature, and... I have to think that overall, there is a single spirit that runs this whole business. And then there are probably four other spirits of the four four-headed creatures that are probably working in concert. I can't verify that, can't say that with any certainty, but when God creates something that has the face of a man, then I suspect that there's some intellect behind it. Can I prove it? No, certainly can't. <laughs> when they had, when they stood, these stood, and when they were lifted up, these lifted up themselves also, for the spirit of the living creature was in them. Then the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubims. So suddenly God is standing over the cherubims. And the cherubims lifted up their wings and mounted up from earth in my sight. And when they went out, the wheels also were beside them. And everyone stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was over above them. This is the living creature that I saw under the God of Israel by the river of Kabar, and I knew that they were the cherubims. Everyone had four faces apiece, and everyone had four wings, and the likeness of the hands of a man was under their wings. And the likeness of their faces was the same faces which I saw by the river of Kabar, and their appearances themselves, they were went everyone straight forward. So he's referring back to the earlier chapter and telling us that, yes, this is the same creatures that I saw the first time, only this is the second time. Okay, I'm going to go to the next chapter and make sure there's nothing else in there. Uh, I don't think, yeah, no, we go on backwards. All right, so the reason that I wanted to see all this together is because there are some questions that I have to ask when I look at this. And it is apparent to me, especially from the end of the description in chapter 10, that when God is above them, that this is God's chariot. This is God's aircraft. This is God's spaceship. This is God's hot rod. This is how God travels when he wants to. I don't think anybody's going to agree, disagree with me. <laughs> There's a purpose for this living creature, and the living creature is uh, God's hot rod. There's no... I, when you look at it, there's nothing else that even presents itself as anything else. Um, this is a very capable creature, capable of going lots of different places, including the house of God. Uh, have any of us seen this except for Ezekiel? I have my doubts. Maybe John saw something like it. If so, he didn't record it. <laughs> he saw the Son of Man. He saw God himself, Yasha, our Messiah, in greater detail than this description. Um, there's a lot going on here. The question I have for you, and I hesitate to ask this question, strongly hesitate to ask this question. Why does God need a car? Why does God need a car? I can't hear you if you're talking. I know that it kind of blows your mind because I can see your eyeballs. <laughs> Turn on your mic, though. Do you guys have any idea why God needs a car? I don't know. Maybe that's how the spirit of God travels. But he doesn't need it. He could just appear somewhere. But I think he likes it. Like, we like hot dogs, hot, hot rods and and Mercedes and... Okay. Maybe that's the case. Car. Maybe that's the case. Fact is, God's got a car. It's pretty cool. 
Is this the father's car? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think the father... You think, it's, you think it's Messiah's car? I think it's the Messiah's car exclusively. And I could be wrong about that, but I don't think the father has any need or desire to travel that way. In fact, it tells us something about the father. So if you take what we're reading here and you take what we read about the temple itself, which we're going to get into in much, much greater detail, we see that the father interacts with us and with the Messiah and with our environment differently than the Messiah does. And when you go to see the father, how do you do that? There's only one way to do that. You can't get to the Father except by the Messiah. So this is a principle that has been in operation from day one, literally day one, and the Messiah is the one who has interacted largely. I'm not saying he's the only one who's interacted, but he's the one who has largely interacted with humanity all the way through. The Father is there, involved in every single aspect, but the Messiah is the one that interacts with us, primarily. And I say that because of the system that God has set up. Like I said, we're going to go through this in great depth when we start going through the temple. The Father can only be gotten to through one door. Christ is the way and the truth and the life and the door and all those things. And if you look at a picture of the temple, which most pictures are completely wrong, but what you see is one door into the temple, and you see the two pillars standing on the porch, or on the foundation in front of what we call the porch, and the porch is five times taller than those pillars. The pillars are about 56 feet tall. The porch, what we call the porch, is the Messiah, with the door at the bottom, the two doors, and that's 255 feet tall, approximately. So that porch, what they call the porch, is actually a really tall building that's 255 feet tall. And then the two pillars, Joaquin and Boaz, stand in front of him. They're the doorkeepers. So go back to Matthew and, you know, the, the, the uh, Gospels. You know, he that is greatest among you will be a doorkeeper. <laughs> and this is who you're talking about. They're the doorkeepers. The two witnesses are the doorkeepers of the Messiah. And the Messiah is the only way you can get in to see the Father. And this is an absolute. There is no other way. There is no other possibility of anything else happening except this, metaphorically or otherwise. So I'm just reinforcing this with the description of what we have here with the cherubim. And I hesitate to even say anything like this, but the reality is, is that I'm fairly certain that we exist on two different planes. The Father is able to be outside our universe and inside our universe at the same time. I'm pretty sure. Now, this is completely speculation. I'm not going to say anything more about this than that, but I'm fairly certain that's the way this works. And the Messiah is able to be in our universe with us. So it's an interesting circumstance. And like I said, it's a theoretical guess at what's going on because of God's descriptions. But I'm pretty certain that that's the fact. The temple is actually really a portal to get to the Father. And it works in every single way, metaphorically. I'm not saying this categorically. I'm not saying it's absolute truth. But I suspect that this is what's happening. It's important because we see the importance of our Messiah in our existence. The Father 
is beyond and above everything in our environment. Absolutely beyond and above it. But he's here seeing everything at the same time. He can exist where he wants, I'm certain. <laughs> but we're in an envelope that contains time, and God does not live in an envelope that contains time. So he's outside the envelope. There's a lot of things going on in this discussion. But know that when I say God's all-powerful, know very, very clearly that when I'm saying this, I'm saying that he's literally beyond our universe even. And if you don't know what kind of power that is, <laughs> then you ought to really consider all things, because this is power beyond any imagination. And if God has created 50 or 100 or an infinite amount of other universes and is capable of keeping track of all of those, all that does is make him greater than anything we know now. Know that God is great <laughs> and big and amazing and good. And he can do things exactly as he wants, whenever he wants. So, there's a lot of other things we'll go through when we talk about this again, but um, let's go back to where we were. Um, I think we're in chapter two. So we've just gone through this dream. God's given him, Ezekiel, this dream. And what is the purpose of that dream? How does it relate to the prophecies that come after? And really, it's hard to find any relation. We find some relation when we get back to chapter 10. Um, and it's an important relation. It's the reason why I think God showed us this, or one of the reasons why God showed us all of this. But now we're talking to Ezekiel. We're talking about Ezekiel. And we have God or somebody representing him directly speaking to Ezekiel. And he said unto me, Son of man, stand upon your feet, and I will speak unto you. And the Spirit entered into me when he spoke unto me, and set me upon my feet, that I heard him that spoke unto me. So when God's Spirit enters in such power, <laughs> you don't even really notice the mundane things like standing up. And he was in a circumstance where, in all likelihood, uh, he had no real... You know, it wasn't like he was awake, you know, doing something or controlling his own motions in the same way. This is a dream sort of state. So the spirit entered him in power and he stood up. And he said unto me, Son of man, I send you to a children to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me even unto this very day. For they are impudent children and stiff hearted. I do send you unto them, and you shall say unto them, Thus says the Lord God. Thus says the Lord God. When God speaks in this fashion, you don't really want to be the object of this discussion. When God calls you impudent and stiff-hearted, you better listen. Who does God send prophets to? Impudent, stiff-hearted, stiff-necked Israelites. That's who he sends prophets to. I do send you unto them, and you shall say unto them, Thus says the Lord God. And of all the prophecies... In the Bible, 
This is one of the most important prophecies in the end time. Bar none, it is more important in this moment than virtually any other prophecy in the Bible. There might be a couple that are on the same plane. But this is life or death. So how many times has God told you to choose life or death? Choose this day, life or death, blessing or cursing. How many times in the Bible has God said that? How many times did the Messiah say it when he was here? I, I don't know the actual number. I'm just, he said it a lot. And Moses said it a lot. And the prophets have said it a lot. And we're going to see that more and more in Ezekiel. Choose life or choose death. And what we see right here in Ezekiel 2 is the difference between life and death and how we choose it. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. What does that sentence mean? For they, and they, whether they will hear, whether they will listen, or ignore. Forbear means ignore. In this context. Whether you live or whether you die is dependent upon whether you listen or ignore the words of this prophet. Really, really important. Extraordinarily important in this time. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, listen or ignore, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there has been a prophet among them. When they hear this man's words, they will know, regardless of whether they listen or whether they ignore, they will know that there has been a prophet among them. I want to pause for a second because I lost my... Okay, my, my drama was a little bit taken away because I lost my people because the internet went down a little bit. Uh, they're back, and we're going to start again in verse 5. And they, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, whether they will listen or ignore, for they are a rebellious house, yet shall know that there has been a prophet among them. <sighs> Listening or ignoring the prophet in the end time is going to be a serious problem. It is going to be whether you live or whether you die. That's how big a problem it is whether you disbelieve or whether you believe. This is an issue of faith. It's an actual issue of the measure of your faith. And some will hear, some will listen, a few, and most will forbear or ignore the prophet. That's how it's going to be in the end time. Don't make any mistake about it. We're talking about the narrow path here or the wide path. And your faith is measured in this statement. Just as it was measured when Moses said it first, well, maybe when God said it first in the Garden of Eden, and not exactly those words. But Moses said it very clearly. Set before you this day, blessing and cursing, life and death. Choose life that you and your seed may live. You and your children may live. This is the choice that we find in the end time. And it's about whether you listen or ignore. <sighs> and when I, when I say that, it's literally about whether you listen or ignore. This doesn't seem like much. In this modern world, we have lots of things to listen to. Tons of things to listen to. 
And there are lots and lots and lots of things we can ignore. In this time, whether we live or whether we die is dependent upon whether we listen or ignore some guy saying something about God. And the harsh reality is, is that in the churches of God, we're used to ignoring everybody except for the few people around us. Not everybody. But this is a painful, painful circumstance to me. When I look at this circumstance and I see how easily a decision is made, and the decision is not made by actively choosing oh, well, I want to be in God's kingdom and I'm going to live and therefore, well, it is actively made that way. But death isn't made that way. The choice to die is made by simply doing nothing. It's made by ignoring what's around you. It's made by not acting deliberately to find God. It is a deliberate act to find God. It is a requirement that you be paying attention and that you actively try and seek God. And in the end time, if you do that, at some point you will run into this guy. Not Ezekiel. The guy Ezekiel's talking about. Now we're reading about Ezekiel right here, and it's talking about Ezekiel. But this is a prophecy of the end time. The prophecy that Ezekiel was involved in was more about the end time than his time. And this is a really, really serious big deal. Most people ignore anyone they want to ignore at any time they feel like doing it. This guy, you better not ignore because he's going to give you the choice. He's going to stand in front of you and you are going to make your choice whether to live or die. And it's simply a question of whether you listen or whether you ignore or reject the words that come out of his mouth. I would be very, very careful in this time. So how do we know this is a prophecy of the end time? It's actually really easy because, verse 6, You, son of man, be not afraid of them, neither be afraid of their words, though briars and thorns be with you, and you do dwell among scorpions. Be not afraid of their words, nor dismayed at their high looks, though they be a rebellious house. The son of man there is the clue. If you don't know what the Son of Man means, then you should find out. Christ was called the Son of Man many times. Ezekiel was called the Son of Man. Isaiah, Jeremiah. Basically, the man on the scene, on the earth, upon the earth, is called the Son of Man. It's a title <laughs> of God's guy on the earth. And when the Messiah was here, he was called the Son of Man. The title transcends being here on earth. But this is what God calls his guy on the planet in the circumstance mm -hmm. that they're in. Verse 7, you shall speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. You shall speak my words unto them. And they will decide whether to listen or whether to ignore, for they are most rebellious. Circumstances are the same for Ezekiel as they were for Jeremiah or Isaiah 
or many of the minor prophets because the context here is the destruction of God's temple. The context here is the destruction of God's people. The context here is the same as the context for virtually all the prophets, God's disobedient people being corrected. How much do people like to be corrected? Almost never. They hate anyone who corrects them. Why did people hate the Messiah? Because he corrected them. He told them they were doing things wrong. He told them that they were doing everything wrong. And what did they do? They killed him. We killed him. And if they hated him, boy, howdy, they're going to kill, they're going to hate everyone of his household. And very shortly, we're coming up against a circumstance where we're either going to be counted of his household and stand up as pillars, or whether we are going to deny him and eventually die. Right here, we have the circumstance of living or dying. Sorry about that. I had that thing in front. The difference between living and dying is whether you listen or ignore. If you listen, what happens? If you listen, what happens? You admit your sin. Because what do prophets do? They correct you. They tell you your sins. Does this seem hypocritical? Yes, it does. Is it offensive? To almost everyone, yes. Why does God say, O Jerusalem, that kills the prophets? I sent you my own son. And what did you do? You killed him. Does anybody like it? when their nose is rubbed in their sins by a prophet? Answer, no. Flat out, straight out, always, no. We don't like that. Nobody likes to have their nose rubbed in their sins or in their, their wrongdoing or in their anything that they don't want to admit. If you don't admit your sin, God will kill you. You will not be in God's kingdom unless you admit your sin. That's the lowest bar. That's the lowest hurdle. Admit you're wrong for real and that you're full of sin and God will save you. Stand up as a pillar and you may just be part of the inner court of the temple of God. These are choices that people make. And they begin with listening or ignoring a man of God. In the end time, who's different from all the others? How is he different? Have you ever heard of Elijah? Hmm. Yeah, everybody's heard of him. What's different? about Elijah than everybody else. It's really famous. This is an easy one. Really, really famous. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. That's the difference. It's one voice crying in the wilderness. That's how you identify it. Who Elijah is. That's one way. And also, and you shall speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear. For they are most rebellious. If you can't tell the difference between truth 
spoken to you and lies spoken to you, then you're in serious trouble. Serious trouble. If you can't tell the difference between truth and lies, then you're going to have a hard time in the end time. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. And if you don't hear God's voice in the end time, it's going to be rough. Probably. Goat. Chaff. There's a lot of different descriptions the Bible has for people who don't hear his voice. If you cannot understand the truth that is in front of you, if you don't see it, I'm sorry. Either learn to see it, find out who God is well enough to be able to see the difference between truth and lies, or there is no help for you. Everybody's had the opportunity. Everybody's had the choice to follow God or not follow God. There's nobody that has been without a choice except for maybe a few vessels of destruction that God created from the beginning as vessels of destruction. Is it fair that they didn't get a choice? Yeah, why? Because God's the potter. He makes the pots how he wants. You make a pot that's designed to be destroyed, then it's designed to be destroyed and it will be destroyed. You know, when you build a bridge, what happens when you build a bridge? Let's pretend you're building a stone bridge across a creek. How do you get all those stones to stay there? You just throw them all up in the air and they just land perfectly and suddenly there's a bridge? No. No, that's not how it works. First, you have to build a wood arch. You have to build a wood arch. And then you lay all those stones in place on that wood arch until you get up to the top, and then you put in that capstone that has a different shape than all the other stones. And once that capstone is in place, and everything is down tight, stomped in good, and, you know, put in place with pressure on it, then those rocks start to bear the pressure themselves. And then you take the wood out from underneath, you tear it out, you rip it out, and the stones stand on their own. There's no other way to build that bridge. Well, it was some really high technology, but in the normal course of events, that's how you build a bridge. What happens to the wood? Use it for another project, maybe, but it's probably got nails and it's torn up and, you know, it probably is suitable for the fire, firewood. It's been, a lot of it's been sitting there in the water for a long period of time. Might have not even very, very good firewood. When you build something, there is scrap left over. There is construction waste. And God building what he's building leaves some construction waste. Is that sad? Yeah, it's sad. But what's the alternative? Not building anything. Does God do nothing? No. God's into building stuff and doing stuff. And guess what? With us as his family, we can do a lot of things together. And probably a lot of things that don't need construction waste in the same fashion. And maybe there will be projects with a lot of construction waste in the future. I don't know. I don't want to be construction waste. I want to be a stone. in the temple, or whatever, <laughs> in the bridge, if we stay with the metaphor. But there are those that had no choice and will have no chance to get in the kingdom of God. Are they a lot? I don't know. God's the one who makes that decision, and I can't identify them all. But more people die than live. Because we know that there's a wide, wide gate to destruction and a narrow, straight gate 
to life. And what are you going to choose? Verse 7 again, and you shall speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will forbear, for they are most rebellious. But you, O son of man, hear what I say unto you. Be you not rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. Rebellion is the basic problem. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. He has a choice of opening his mouth or not opening his mouth. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. Huh. This is a book. Interesting. Open your mouth and eat this book. And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and was written within and without. And there was write, written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. Horrible stuff. The book's full of lamentations and mourning and woe. And again, I'm going to pause because I lost them again. Okay, we're back. It was a little while. Sorry about that. Um, we were looking at Ezekiel. Yeah. 2, 7 through 10, right quick. I'm going to go ahead and read through this one more time just to keep the context. And you shall speak my words unto them, whether they will hear or whether they will ignore, for they are most rebellious. <clears throat> but you, O son of man, hear what I say unto you. Be not rebellious like that rebellious house. Open your mouth and eat what I give you. So eat what I give you. And we're going to talk about what that is. Verse 9, And when I looked, behold, an hand was sent unto me, and lo, a roll of a book was therein. And he spread it before me, and it was written within and without, and there was written therein lamentations and mourning and woe. And the chapter break here is bogus. There's a word in there that indicates that it could be the end of a chapter or the end of a prophecy, but it's not in this case. Uh, the moreover... <laughs> sometimes denotes a change of topic. In this case, it does not. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat, you, eat what you find, eat this roll, and go and speak unto the house of Israel. So what's a roll? Well, it's a scroll. It's a book. And it was written within and without obvious. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that roll. Scroll, book, etc. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause your belly to eat and fill your bowels with this roll that I give you. Then I did eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. It's sweet to understand all the things that you haven't understood. It is sweet in your mouth to understand these things. And he said unto me, Son of man, go and get you unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. For you are not sent to a people of a strange speech and of a hard language, but to the house of Israel, not to many people of a strange speech and of a hard language, whose words you cannot understand. Surely had I sent them you to them, they would have hearkened unto you. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto you, for they will not hearken unto me. For all the house of our Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. We're going to stop there for a minute, because we have some other things to talk about. God says, hey, Ezekiel, you got to eat this scroll. You got to eat this book. You got to understand the words that I speak to you. You got to get this. And guess what? Ezekiel eats it. And it was in his house, in his mouth, as honey for sweetness. Tastes good understanding, wisdom, knowledge of God is good. How do we know this is an end time scripture? Because there are other references similar to this. <laughs> and let's go over there right now. Revelation chapter 5, starting with verse 1. 
And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, within and without, kind of like Ezekiel's, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look therein or thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. There's some questions we got to answer about this, but I'm going to read through it a little more before I tell you what's going on here. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. So we have to stop there because this is so dramatic and has so many connections back to where we just were that we have to stop. So first off, we have to realize that we're talking about a book and that no one is able to open or read the book or look at it even. Why? No one was worthy to read this book. What does this book say? This book describes how the world is going to be saved. And until someone was perfect and did everything correctly, the book could not be opened. Why couldn't the book be opened? No one was going to open it. Nobody was capable of opening it. Nobody, everybody had sin. Nobody was capable of opening it. These are mostly rhetorical questions. <laughs> they couldn't open it. Nobody could open it except the Lion of the tribe of Judah, a son of David, who was perfect. He was the only one who could open it. He was the only one who could save this planet. He was the only one who could loose the seals. That would what? What do the seals do? The seals are what release the prophecies and cause things to happen in the end time. Nobody could do that except our Messiah. And he did. It's important. <laughs> that I emphasize that right here. Verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain. This is a dis precise description of the Messiah being sacrificed. And what do we have here? <gasps> Could it be that we have the same exact creature? <laughs> that Ezekiel described <laughs> in depth, here written again. The throne, the throne also, the throne and the four beasts in the midst of the elders, and here we have the lamb. And then we also have these seven horns and seven eyes, which are also very important because the two witnesses are mentioned in regards to them several times in Zechariah and other places. Yeah, limited, but there which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. The seven eyes are important. They're in one stone. Zerubbabel has them. And then Joshua the high priest has them. Kind of important. Who are they in relation to? The lamb as it had been slain. Nobody gets the eyes or the spirits or any of that business around them except they're really close to the lamb. Who's really close to the lamb? The two witnesses. Look it up. I'm not going to go back and hit all that stuff right now. 
Okay. Seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Those are important spirits. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. So the lamb that was slain came and took the book out of the father's hand. He was in heaven at this point, sitting upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for you were slain and has redeemed us to God by the blood, by your blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And this is obviously speaking about Christ. Everybody knows that. <laughs> there are a few things they don't know about this. <laughs> And, hey, and have made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Where do we reign? On the earth. Who did God give the earth to? Us. Did he give us heaven? No. He didn't give us the heavens. He gave us the earth. And then we're still continuing on in verse 11. I'll just go a couple more verses here. I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing, and every creature which is in the heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard, I sang blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever." Everybody's saying this all at once. This is a big, serious deal. This is God conquering the entire earth, and it's described in the mechanism of a little book that he gave to Ezekiel to eat. And where do we see it? In Revelation, well after Ezekiel was <laughs> gone to his father's. Is that the end of the story? No, not even close. <laughs> so let's go over to the next place that we see something that directly, directly relates to this. It's Revelation 10. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was set upon his head, and his face were, was as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. And he had in his hand a little book open. Whoa. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? We saw the little book back in Ezekiel. And then we saw the book in Revelation 5. And the Messiah opened it. And now we have somebody else bringing the little book open after the Messiah opened it and set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth. Well, what does this mean? <laughs> now that the book's open, the seals have been loosed, some things are going to happen. Some things are going to happen. Because we have an angel, a mighty angel, coming down with that book in his hands after the Messiah opened it, and now he's saying, hey, let's do some stuff. We got the book open. Let's read from it. And he put his hand, his foot upon the sea, his right foot upon the sea, and his left foot upon the, the earth. Does that tell you it might going to be affect every part of the planet? And cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars, and he cry, had cried, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Huh. Seven thunders. Really curious about the seven thunders. <laughs> I suspect we're going to see some of those thunders here pretty quick. Why? Because the seven thunders 
would be recognizable. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars, and when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and don't write them. Don't write them. Why? Because we get it. That one's hidden. We can't understand that one because he didn't tell us, because it would be visible to us and understandable in the circumstance. And guess what? God's trying to create faith in man. When you recognize your circumstance perfectly, faith doesn't come into it. Don't write this, what the seventh thunder say. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven and swore by him that lives forever and ever, who created the heaven and the things that are therein, and the earth and the things that are therein, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. But in the days of the voice of the seven angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he has declared to his servants the prophets. Like Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel, to name a few. And the voice which I heard from the heaven spoke to me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open from the hand of the angel which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went to the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make your belly bitter, but it shall be in your mouth as honey. Is this the same book that Ezekiel ate? Yes, it is. Is there any doubt? Not if you understand who God is. Not if you know anything about God. There are so many cross-references here that it is utterly correct and true to add these, to, to put these scriptures in the same context. If you can't do that, then you should do something else with your life. So, take it up. Take it, eat it up, and it shall make your belly bitter, but it shall be in your mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth as sweet as honey. And as soon as I, I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. <sighs> understanding, knowledge, understanding of God and his plan, knowledge, this little book is what? What is this little book? People think that, that God speaks and writes things down and there's no, it's just a book. It is, but he records books himself for good reason. This little book is none other than your Bible. And I say that with absolute confidence. The little book, the little open scroll, is the Bible. And it describes all of the prophecies, all of the everything that is going to happen, except for some minor stuff, in the end time, from the beginning of the earth until the end. And it had to be opened by someone who was worthy. And once opened, the solution to the problems is available. It's there, and God has given it to us. Understanding, wisdom, knowledge of God is where? In the Bible. It's clear. It's crystal clear. And he said unto me, you must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. This story of this little book is not hidden anymore. 
then you have understood what it means if you have listened to my words. But if you ignore them, watch out! Let's go back to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 3. Let's read it again from verse 1. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, eat what you find. Eat this roll and go and speak unto the house of Israel. So I opened my mouth, and he caused me to eat that scroll, that book. And he said unto me, Son of man, cause your belly to eat, and fill your bowels with this roll that I give you. Then I did eat it, and it was in my mouth as honey for sweetness. And he said it unto me, Son of man, go and get you unto the house of Israel, and speak with my words unto them. For you are not sent to a people of strange speech and of an hard language, but to the house of Israel. Then, or now, in the end time, to the house of Israel. Not to a people of strange speech and of an hard language, whose words you cannot understand. Surely, had I sent you unto them, they would have hearkened unto you. What does that mean for the end time? It means that wherever God's people are, the prophet that he sends is going to speak the same language. But the house of Israel will not hearken unto you. They will not listen unto you. After all that we just talked about, listen and ignore, listen and ignore, God says, but the house of Israel will not hearken unto you. They will not listen unto you, for they will not listen to me. For all the house of Israel are impudent and hard-hearted. Second time he said that. Behold, I have made your face strong against their faces and your forehead strong against their foreheads. As an adamant, harder than flint have I made your forehead. Fear them not, neither be dismayed at their looks, though they be a rebellious house. Don't care what they say. Don't pay attention to what they say. Ignore them. Speak my words. That's what God's saying to this man. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, all my words that I shall speak unto you receive in your heart and hear with your ears. The whole Bible. Receive in your heart and hear with your ears. And go and get you to them of the captivity unto the children of your people and speak unto them and tell them, thus says the Lord God, whether they will listen or ignore these words spoken by a man sent by God. How many times has God done this? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, etc., etc., Zechariah, Zephaniah, Haggai, Malachi, all of them, and a bunch more that aren't even in the Bible. A ton more of them that aren't in the Bible. Go and get you to the captivity, to them of the captivity. Where does God say he's going to save his people? In Babylon. We started this whole thing out with the wilderness. In the wilderness, by the river Kabar. Where's that? Babylon, Assyria, whatever. They were both part of the same thing doesn't make any difference whether it's Assyria or Babylon. In the end, it's Babylon. What's the difference between living and dying? Listening and ignoring. Ignore at your peril. Then the Spirit took me up, and I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing, saying, Blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. From where? The throne of God. How many times have we talked about the throne of God in this context? This is where God lives every day. Do you think it might be important? Just a little? I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another, and the noise of the wheels over against them, and a noise of great rushing. Again, we're going somewhere. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness. 
Oh, well, no, hold on a second. Ezekiel said it was only like the sweetness of honey. I went in bitterness, in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Why did Ezekiel go in bitterness? Why does one of the two witnesses described in Revelation talk about bitterness? It's actually quite easy. It's sweet as honey to understand what God says, to have knowledge and understanding of God and what he's going to do. Initially, it's sweet. Guess what happens when you get to realize that most people on the planet are going to die and how they're going to die and all the things that are going to kill them? God's people primarily at the focus of all this. It's kind of bitter. It's difficult to face. The destruction of the entire planet, as we know it, everything in our life, in our lifetimes that we've come to know, except God, is going to change radically, painfully, through the valley of the shadow of death. And the only way out is by faith. Is that easy? Is there anything easy about that? Is there anything that's not painful about that? If you have a stomach ache over that, you're lucky. That's all you have. So the Spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness in the heat of my spirit, but the hand of the Lord was strong upon me. Then I came to them of the captivity at Tel Aviv, Tel Aviv that dwelt by the river of Kebar, and I sat where they sat and remained there, astonished, astonied, among them seven days, unable to do anything but blubber. Painful, ugly circumstance. Took him a week to even be able to stand up again. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, I have made you a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I hear that word watchman, I always struggle to keep a straight face. Why do I do that? It makes me want to laugh, not because of the circumstance, but because of the circumstance that we have in our existence. Lots of people call themselves watchmen. Lots of people are like, yeah, we're watching from the walls and whatever. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I just have to laugh because they're all looking the wrong direction. See, everybody decides that once they're the watchmen that they have to look out and see what's happening in the world. And the news is what's important. And suddenly you have to know everything about what's going on. And you have to report, oh, from wherever, Israel or Russia or Europe or Japan or whatever. Because something's happening and we got to watch this. And, and Okay. I'll just say that has nothing to do with God. Because when God sets up a watchman, what does he do? He said, therefore, hear the word at my mouth, at God's mouth, and give them warning from me. A watchman listens to God and says, you're warned. Don't do this. Do that. Stop that. Or whatever it is that God says. It's a prophetic circumstance. It has nothing to do with anything outside of listening to God and then saying what he said. That's it. A watchman who's telling you the news or what happened in Israel yesterday or... Uh, Europe and whatnot is not performing the job of a watchman. 
he's performing the job of a herald or a news anchor or something like that. A herald tells you the news. You know, you use the 15th century equivalent. That's a herald. That's significantly different than what God calls a watchman. Though we seem to have lost the definition of this word. Listen to my word at my mouth. Why does he say at my mouth? Because it's directly from God. The understanding, the comprehension of the words of God is direct. There's no mistaking where it came from. It's not a game of telephone with 23 people in a line. It's God, prophet, speaks to the people. That's how that works. That's a watchman. So, verse 18, when I say, says God, when I say unto the wicked, you shall surely die, and you don't give them warning, nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your hand. Oh no. There's a responsibility for being a watchman. You might have blood attributed to you if you don't do what you're supposed to do. This watchman business is serious. You either repeat what I say, or this may catch up with you and kill you too, is what God's saying. When I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, and you give him not warning, nor speak to, the, to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at your hand. Yet if you warn the wicked, and he turns not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. The wicked still dies, or might turn and live. But the watchman who speaks lives. Again, when a righteous man does turn from his righteousness and commits iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because you have not given him warning, he shall die in his sin, and his righteousness, which he has done, shall not be remembered. But his blood will I require at your hand. What happens if the watchman does not speak? Some righteous people are going to die. Period. Because they were not warned when they stepped into iniquity, into sin, into stupidity, into modern Christianity. Verse 22, And the hand of the Lord was there upon me, and he said unto me, Arise, and go forth into the plain, and I will talk with you there. And I rose and went forth into the plain, and behold, the glory of the Lord stood there as the glory which I saw by the river Kabar, and I fell on my face. Then the Spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet and spoke with me and said unto me, Go, shut yourself within your house. But you, O son of man, behold, they shall put bands upon you and shall bind you with them, and you shall not go out among them. What does that mean? Sounds like prison to me. And I will make your tongue cleave to the roof of your mouth, that you shall be dumb and shall not be to them a reprover, for they are a rebellious house. But when I speak with you, I will open your mouth, and you shall say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, He that hears, let him hear, and he that forbears or ignores, let him ignore, for they are a rebellious house. The context hasn't changed here at all. It's about whether you listen or whether you ignore. And guess what? Sometimes God's going to shut this guy up. He's not going to be able to speak. Why? That you shall not correct them. What is to be a reprover? That means to not correct somebody for their sin. He just said we're going to die if you don't speak. And then he said, and God says, I'm going to shut you up and you're not going to be able to speak. Kind of a catch-22, isn't it? Who wants to be this guy? Prison? 
Yeah, it is what it is. Prophets have never had it easy. You also, son of man, take you a tile, and lay it before you, and portray upon the city, even Jerusalem, and lay siege against it, and build a fort against it, and cast a mount against it, and set the camp also against it, and set battering rams against it round about. So we're going into a section here of Ezekiel that is a little different than what we've seen before. Everything we've seen before is direct. And what we're seeing in Ezekiel now is what God told Ezekiel to do to describe, excuse me, the circumstance to the people of God in Jerusalem. Why is this important in the end time? Because this is a small model of our same circumstance. Is the prophet of the end time, one of the two witnesses, going to do this? Actual physical stuff? No, he's not. He doesn't need to. Ezekiel already did it. It's recorded here so that we know. It's all a part of that same little scroll, a little open scroll we were talking about over there in Revelation 5 and 10. But the same physical things would be relatively meaningless in this society. In that society, everybody knew that Ezekiel was a prophet. And whenever Ezekiel did anything, everybody was like, huh, we got to check this out. He didn't need Facebook or Twitter or whatever. Everybody'd come by and check it out. So we have this circumstance where Ezekiel <laughs> is showing them what is going to happen piece by piece, moment by moment, to, to Jerusalem with all of them disbelieving. Why is that important? Because it's no different in this time. Who is going to listen to a prophet of God in this day of technology? Not many, very, very, very few people would consider it anything except for the greatest sense, sort of nonsense. Nonsense. Because if you believe in God in this time, in this day and age, then you have to disbelieve most of the things that you've learned in your life. Most of them. About technology, about a variety of different things. I'm actually quite at harmony with technology. I understand what it is. I understand where it's going. I understand why it's going where it is. I'm fully comfortable with it. It's all stuff that God created. It's all stuff that's part of the universe that we're in. <laughs> but man, they don't get that part of it. They use everything to disprove God as much as they possibly can. So faith is rare because we can do magical things with technology. And we reach out and try to take God's throne from it, doing it. And that's never going to succeed. It cannot happen because God's not going to let it happen. So Ezekiel is playing... Tinker Toys, uh, the little blocks. The, yeah. He's building the scenario, showing the people of Jerusalem that they're going to die. Does it apply to us just as well as it did to them? Absolutely. In spades. You also, son of man, take you a tile and lay it before you and portray upon it the city, even Jerusalem. So take a big, big tile and draw out the city of Jerusalem, the walls and all that business, and lay siege against it, and build a fort against it, and cast a mount against it, and set a camp against it also, and set battering rams against it round about. So, you know, you see these guys with these giant tables that have battles that are all set out, and they're recreating the Civil War on their pool table or something down in the basement. This is what God told Ezekiel to do. Moreover, take you 
unto you an iron pan and set it for a wall of iron between you and the city. <laughs> Take a big old iron skillet or, you know, what are the flat ones? Big old flat iron skillet and put it between you and the people of the city. And set your face against it, and it shall be besieged, and you shall lay siege against it. This shall be a sign to the house of Israel. Because they walk by, and Ezekiel's out here in the street <laughs> with his little panorama of battle. And he's laying siege against the house of Israel with an iron pan up against his face. I shudder to think where they would put you in this day and age if you did this. <laughs> You'd probably end up in Canada or something. I, I have no idea. Just somewhere. <laughs> and lie you also upon your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. And according to the number of days that you shall lie upon it, you shall bear their iniquity. <sighs> that must have hurt. I mean, that must have hurt. Ezekiel's all doing everything as right as possible. And God says, all right, well, lie on your left side and lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of days that you shall lie upon it, you shall bear their iniquity. You have to bear the punishment of these jackasses' sins because I said so. Do you rebel against God because you get punished for something you didn't do? Let's just say that most people would. Did our Messiah rebel against being crucified horrifyingly for no reason? No, he didn't. And neither did Ezekiel, of course. Because Ezekiel was like God. And when I say that, I mean Ezekiel had done everything his whole life to follow God. Did he do it as well as the Messiah? No. Of course not. Only the Messiah can open the book. Could open the book. He already opened the book. Verse 5, for I have laid upon you the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, 390 days, so shall you bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. So the pain is measured in days and years. Ow. Ow. This is about, as I recall, nine. What was it, nine and a quarter, nine and a half times worse than the pain of Judah. So we have the pain of Judah at 40 years, which we'll get to here shortly. And we have the pain of Israel and Jerusalem, 390 days. More or less nine times worse than the punishment of Judah. Yep, that's coming to us. We can talk about that more another time. <sighs> For I have laid upon you the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, 390 days, so shall you bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. And when you have accomplished them, lie again on your right side, and you shall bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I have appointed each day, each, appointed you each day for a year. Why does Judah get so much less punishment than Jerusalem and Israel? And I say it, Jerusalem and Israel, because in the end time, that's where it's at. A lot of reasons. It's about sons. It's about sons that leave and about sons that stay. And Judah has stayed with their God. And where did Jerusalem and Israel go? 
They went walkabout. He went walkabout. Left God, left his law, left everything about all the things that God does, wanted us to do, commanded us to do. And Israel and Jerusalem did worse than their fathers over and over and over again. And it was a horror to God. And it still is. And from that moment until this moment, that's where we're at. It's about sons. It's about sons who stay, and it's about prodigal sons who go. The prodigal son is this story. This is the prodigal son. God rejoices when his prodigal son comes back. But the prodigal son takes a lot more damage than the son who stays and obeys. The prodigal son learns more from his damage, learns more from his travels, understands more from the whole circumstance. And in God's world, there's other things related to this that are at issue. The house of God no longer resides with Judah. It was removed at his death. When the veil was rent, the house of God left Judah. And the house of God was reinstated in Israel. And this is important because the house of God still resides in Israel, in the people of God in Jerusalem, which is in captivity to Babylon. Really important that you know this. Where does God save his people? In Babylon. The first time, anyway. The first time. Really, really important that you know that this right here is the story of the prodigal son. <laughs> Judah and Israel are who the prodigal sons were representative of. That was God telling us something that we didn't understand at all. We can, you know, there's lots of lessons you can get from the prodigal son that aren't related to this. But this is the main point of the whole thing. And yes, the prodigal son does take a lot more damage. Verse 7, therefore you shall set your face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and your arm shall be uncovered, and you shall prophesy against it. Huh. Your arm shall be uncovered. What does that mean? Bare arm. It means that he would be revealed as a prophet. And it says right after that, and you shall prophesy against it. Your arm will be bare. You will be revealed for your strength. And you shall prophesy against it. There are more places where this is important and more bare arms. Look them up if you want to. And behold, verse 8, I will lay bands upon you and you shall not turn you from one side to another till you have ended the days of your siege. So you lay for a year and a couple months on one side without turning, without getting up. Maybe to poop. Maybe not. Can't even imagine laying on one side for over a year. This is an act of God. And he held him in place because anybody else would have died of the bed sores. So 
Take you also unto you wheat and barley and beans and lentils and millet and fitches and put them in one vessel and make you bread thereof according to the number of the days that you shall lie upon your side. Three hundred and ninety days shall you eat thereof. I can't even imagine putting all the food that I'm going to eat for a year plus into one container and then only eating out of that for over a year. I can't conceive of a container which could contain enough food to get you to survive for one year without building a silo over your head. Somehow I suspect it wasn't like that. Somehow I suspect God fixed it for him. And your food, which you shall eat, shall be by weight, 20 shekels a day, from time to time shall you eat it. 20 shekels? Ah, 20 pennies is what I get out of it. Um, don't know how much 20 pennies is, but I suspect it ain't much. 20 cents a day? Probably more than 20 cents now. Undoubtedly had to be, because they had just weights and measures back then. But still, probably not a lot of money. Well, you shall also drink water by measure. The sixth part of an hin from time to time shall you drink. The sixth part of an hin. I'm not going to look up how much that was. I suspect as a water, a amount of water for a day, it probably wasn't enough. <laughs> it probably wasn't enough. It was probably real dry. Why do I say that? Because this is showing the punishment of Israel. He was starving and thirsty the entire time. He's talking about a siege of a great many people. And the siege was so bad that they ate their arms off. And children or mothers boiled their children in water and ate them. The siege of Jerusalem in that time was horrifying, as was the siege in 70 AD. The Romans were not pleasant. There was nothing left. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, were no better. Probably worse. Hard to say at that point. Really hard to say. And then insult to injury, and you shall eat it as barley cakes, and you shall bake it with dung that comes out of man in their sight. You get to cook on human shit. Feces. Stank feces. And the Lord said, Even thus shall the children of Israel eat their defiled bread among the Gentiles, where I will drive them. I will drive them out of my house. I will drive them out of my sight. I will drive them out of my land. <clears throat> Not too different from what's going to happen soon here. Then said I, said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, my soul has not been polluted. For from my youth, even up until now, I have not eaten that which dies of itself or is torn in pieces. Neither came their abominable flesh into my mouth. <clears throat> I've never eaten pig. I've never broken any of your rules for all these things. <laughs> then he said unto me, Lo, I have given you cow's dung for man's dung, and you shall prepare your bread therewith. Honestly, the relief I would feel at having, being able to use cow's dung to burn instead of human dung is radically enormous. I've been around a lot of campfires in my life. I have been up in the woods a lot. I have smelled different kinds of dung burning at various times. Cow dung, buffalo dung, not bad. It's just fine. I don't recall ever actually cooking on it, <laughs> but it wouldn't bother me much. It's mostly just kind of like sawdust in the end. Um, human dung? Can't even conceive of it. One time I got to smell burning rat dung all night long. 
Um, that was a an experience I will never forget and hope I never have to smell again. Um, I could tell you a story, but it, it, it's a waste of time. I got to smell burning rat dung all night long on a cliff in the middle of nowhere. And I really wish I hadn't started that fire. <laughs> <laughs> bat guano is no different i've smelled that burning before once and not any different human dung uh, i suspect it's far worse than the rat or the bat i really do and may not be greatly different but a horrifying horrifying stench horrifying stench um and then being hungry and thirsty at the same time i that would kill some people. I think they would literally have a heart attack. <laughs> Just having to do that for a year would uh, kill a lot of people. They would not be able to survive that. But Ezekiel was a stout fellow. <laughs> and he survived. Eating bread cooked on cow dung. Moreover, he said unto me, Son of man, behold, I will break the staff of bread in Jerusalem, and they shall eat bread by weight and with care, and they shall drink water by measure and with astonishment. Disbelief of how careful they have to drink water and eat bread. Does that tell you anything about the situation of Jerusalem, actually? Jerusalem doesn't have a lot of water. Jerusalem has to have the water brought in mostly. There's a couple springs, Gihon Spring and a few other things, but that's not going to that's not going to cause everybody to drink water. They have to bring water in in Jerusalem. Always have. And when somebody gets a big army around you and there's not enough water, water or any food gets down to where you're willing to eat your own arm or boil your child, it's bad. It's really bad. Or whether you're willing to kill your father and eat him. It's horrible. These are all examples that are in the Bible. If you don't know these things, then you should study up on that. That they may want bread and water and be astonished, one with another, astonied, and consume away for their iniquity. So here we see that word astonied again, uh, used in reference to people that have had an experience where God reveals himself to them. <laughs> and it's in the same context as someone who is dying of thirst and hunger. Just to give it a little context. So I think we're going to stop there because it's getting late and we can continue on Ezekiel's little journey uh, and his little diorama of death that's going on uh, when we come back next week. Uh, so really important that you get all that about the little roll, the little scroll, the open book. And we'll talk about it again next time.